Chapters nineteen and twenty of Anybody But Anne by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nineteen, the two car stairs. We all three went back to the study. Stone looked thoughtful, even puzzled. It is the most mysterious case I have ever known, he said. I heard you say once, I observed, that the deeper the apparent mystery, the easier the solution and that is true in a way mr sturgis a simple commonplace case with little mystery and much seemingly direct evidence is often more difficult than a case which presents startling and strange features well put in mr markham if another mystery will help you in the matter here it is and he handed fleming stone the typewritten letter a letter always means a great deal said stone as he scrutinized the address markham and i watched him almost breathlessly as he drew out the letter and read it he studied both the sheet and the envelope for a few moments and then looked up and said quietly the letter is a decoy we thought of that said mr markham eager to seem astute and it was mailed the day of mr van wick's death and the letter was written on the typewriter in this very room mailed in the morning and received in the afternoon agreed stone glancing at the postmarks it was written on two different typewriters and to my mind this clearly tells the whole story i am willing to aver that whoever sent this missive abstracted from mrs van wick's room perhaps from her waste-basket a complete letter probably an unimportant one which she had received duly in her friday afternoon mail that letter bore writing only on its first page it might have been a printed advertisement whoever was managing the affair tore off that first page and utilized this second half of the sheet for this letter bringing it in here to write then it was an easy matter to put it back in the envelope thus making it seem like a letter which had come duly through the mail it was brought to you a bit of faked evidence and i doubt if mrs van wick ever saw the letter at all but it was found in a book she was reading the very night the crime occurred said mr markham you mean you have been told that it was have you asked mrs van wick herself would she admit it if she were guilty said mr markham with a triumphant air of having said something clever not in so many words perhaps but surely one could judge from her manner now then to discover who did write this letter which ought not to be at all difficult it does not bear on its face evidence of being the work of either of david van wick's children no agreed mr markham eagerly they would scarcely connive with their stepmother in such a deed i don't mean that there was no conniving nobody really wrote to mrs van wick that she should do this thing and he would protect her the thing is a fraud i tell you and was written merely to throw suspicion on mrs van wick i could have hugged stone for this wherever his deductions might lead it would certainly be toward anybody but anne of course he went on this in no sense exonerates mrs van wick nor does it prove anything except that some one chose this means of throwing suspicion on her it was cleverly done and yet it is after all a clumsy piece of work for it bears on its face the stamp of fraud any one ought to know to-day that the fact of using different typewriters would give away the game therefore it was written by some one who by the way are there any french people in the house stone asked this question after a further perusal of the letter yes said mr markham quickly there are two of them i have a strong conviction that one of them wrote this letter carstairs i told you so and mr markham looked elated he's mr van wick's valet and i knew all along he was in connivance with mrs van wick fleming stone looked at him i have told you he said this letter does not mean connivance would this valet for any reason want to throw suspicion on mrs van wick i don't know and mr markham looked positively sullen because fleming stone's deductions did not seem to agree with his own who is the other french person asked stone it's carstairs mother i said she is housekeeper here carstairs is not a french name no mr stone but she is a french woman i believe her husband was an englishman and her son seems to have the traits of both 
mr van wick considered him an exceptionally good valet please send for them both was fleming stone's order and markham rang the bell the two carstairs came in together and to my mind the mother looked like a lioness defending her young surely whatever traits this strange woman possessed her maternal instinct was among the strongest she looked defiant as she entered and putting carstairs in the background she herself took a chair near stone and seemed ready to answer questions of course we had told fleming stone everything we knew concerning the whole matter he knew of carstairs joy-ride and of his fright lest it be discovered his gaze went past the mother and fastened on the white-faced young man carstairs he said in a quiet pleasant tone you really needn't feel so frightened you didn't kill your master you had no hand in it now secure in the knowledge of your innocence why are you so filled with alarm i'm n not sir and though the valet looked greatly relieved at stone's words he was still nervously agitated but the look of relief on mrs carstairs face was unmistakable a light spread over her whole countenance and she looked like one who had narrowly escaped disaster fleming stone looked at her intently she returned his gaze without fear even with the trace of her usual seductive manner but he seemed to look straight through any mannerism to her very soul after a moment he said and his words shot out suddenly mrs carstairs had you any reason for wishing to fasten this crime on mrs van wick except to direct suspicion from your own son the housekeeper's eyes blazed i hate her and the exclamation seemed wrung from her by stone's compelling eyes why the inquiry was in the most casual tones because she mother young carstairs interrupted her what are you saying collect yourself you make a mistake mrs carstairs gave one frightened bewildered glance at her son and then like a flash she changed the whole expression of her face i beg your pardon she said gently i spoke without thinking i really have no animosity toward mrs van wick i did feel a slight jealousy when she married a man who had promised to marry me but that is past now and i bear her no ill will you are telling deliberate untruth said stone straightforwardly but it does not matter i have learned what i have wanted to know now mrs carstairs you have no notion who sent this letter to mrs van wick i suppose certainly not she returned disdainfully eyeing the letter stone held up you found it in a book as you described to mr markham yes and you came and asked mr sturgis for it saying that he might keep a copy of it i did i have concluded mrs carstairs to grant that request if you will make the copy yourself i cannot use a typewriter mr stone i'm not familiar with the work the valet gave an involuntary glance of surprise at his mother but immediately dropped his eyes again she can use a typewriter i thought to myself and won't admit it but stone said lightly oh that doesn't much matter just write with a lead pencil here is one i prefer not to do it and mrs carstairs looked at the great detective with the air of a frightened animal who does not understand into what snare it is being led why not asked stone because because you seem to have no reason for refusing it is a small matter kindly make a copy at my dictation he offered a pencil and a paper pad to mrs carstairs and though she hesitated she finally took them as there seemed to be nothing else to do in a low clear tone fleming stone read the sentences from the letter waiting after each until mrs carstairs had written it the woman looked utterly miserable it was evident that she could not see why she had to do this but she feared some underlying reason that boded ill for her inexorably stone continued one after another the short direful sentences fell from his lips mrs carstairs grew whiter and her fingers almost refused to hold the pencil but with indomitable courage she persevered to the end after the last word stone held out his hand for the paper and she mutely handed it to him the rest of us sat spellbound there was nothing theatrical in the episode it was the quietest possible procedure and yet the incident seemed fraught with intense mystery and importance 
fleming stone gave the merest glance at the paper tore it into tiny bits and threw it into the waste-basket mrs carstairs he said and his tone was almost careless you wrote that letter yourself on the typewriter in this room it was cleverly done you used the blank half of a letter mrs van wick had already received and the envelope it came in you pretended that she had received and read this letter now you will tell us just why you did this or would you prefer to explain it to the coroner later i didn't it is useless to say you didn't interrupted stone the proof is positive now i'll repeat my question of some time ago did you wish to incriminate mrs van wick merely to divert suspicion from your son or for any other reason again anger and rage gleamed from mrs carstairs eyes she was about to burst into a torrent of language when she controlled herself glanced at her son and said in a low even thrilling tone only to save my son from possible suspicion again you're telling an untruth madam said stone as if it were a matter of no moment you are rather expert at it however if you'll take my advice you will do wisely to adhere to that statement let me suggest that you keep your other reason to yourself you may go for the first time in my experience i saw mrs carstairs face wear a beaten look she rose from her chair a vanquished woman but she had nerve enough to make a slight mocking bow as accompanied by her son she left the room the whole matter of that letter means nothing said fleming stone the case is still the deepest mystery to me i saw at once after i learned mrs carstairs had written that letter that her prime motive was to save that idolized son of hers from accusation or suspicion but another reason was her hatred of mrs van wick i advised her to keep that to herself and as i imagine she will do so i doubt if she can do any more harm how are you sure she wrote the note asked mr markham and i too waited with eagerness for the answer it was a random shot said stone smiling a little although it was quite evident how the thing was done but you remember i asked you if there were any french people about as you see in this letter the word committee is spelled with one m while that might be a mere verbal error it gave me the impression that the note was written by a french native for their word is comité and while the writer of the note is familiar with the english tongue that is a tricky word for a frenchman to spell because of the double letters however that proof needed confirmation so i simply asked the lady to write the note from my dictation and if you please she misspelled committee in exactly the same way even then it might have been that the son wrote it or any one else for that matter but when i declared with conviction that she had written it she was unable to deny it it all sounds so simple now that you explain it i said with a feeling of chagrin that i had not noticed the misspelled word that particular bit of a mystery was simple of solution said stone but it helps us not a bit with the main issue at stone's request we went in search of anne we found her in the music-room with archer they were in close conversation and i had no doubt he was urging her again to give him the right to protect her i knew archer felt as i did that all usual conventions were to be ignored in such circumstances as these we were experiencing fleming stone spoke directly to anne and his calm pleasant manner seemed to imbue her with an equal quietness of demeanour she even almost smiled when stone said please don't think me over intrusive mrs van wick but will you tell me what gown you wore at dinner last friday evening certainly said anne rising if you will come to my room i will show it to you although uninvited archer and i followed on reaching anne's dressing-room she took from a wardrobe the beautiful yellow satin gown which i well remembered and which now seemed to mock at the sombre black robe she wore stone looked at the gown admiringly and seemed to show a special interest in the frills and jabots of the bodice truly this man's ways were past understanding what clue could he expect to find in this way and when you came to your room that night did you keep on this gown until you prepared to retire no said anne looking at him wonderingly but even as she looked her eyes fell before his and she continued in a hesitating way no i changed into a negligee gown may i see that asked stone pleasantly this time it seemed to me with reluctance 
and took from the wardrobe a charming boudoir robe of chiffon and lace it was decorated with innumerable frills and rosettes and again stone seemed eagerly interested in the trimmings he even picked daintily at some of the bows and ruches saying lightly i am not a connoisseur in ladies apparel but this seems to me an exquisite confection it is replied anne it is parisian but she spoke with a preoccupied air and i knew she was deeply anxious as to the meaning of all this she hung the gown back in its place and then stone seated himself after having courteously placed a chair for her i warned you i should ask a few questions mrs van wick he began so please tell me first how you occupied the time before you retired that evening anne's embarrassment had vanished and she looked straight at her questioner as she replied in even tones i'm afraid i did nothing worth while i wrote one or two notes to friends glanced through a book about gardening tried on a new hat and then unpacked a glass vase which mr sturgis brought me because i preferred not to trust that task to a servant and your maid was here when you finally retired no i had dismissed jeannette earlier and told her she need not return and did you leave your rooms late that night no not at all no but anne was fast losing control of herself her voice trembled and her large eyes were fixed on stone's face his expression was one of infinite pity and he said gently please think carefully and be sure of what you are saying i am sure murmured anne and then archer leaned over and whispered to her what he said i do not know but it must have been an accusation of some sort for anne turned scarlet and stared at archer with angry eyes she glanced at her bookshelves and then back at archer and then at stone and finally with a look of pathetic appeal directly at me i knew she was asking my help but what could i do in a sudden desperate attempt to relieve her for at least a moment i turned the subject and touching the beautiful florentine chest on the table beside me i drew stone's attention to it as a work of art yes he agreed it is a fine piece worthy of holding the family heirlooms instead of which i said lightly mrs van wick uses it merely as a receptacle for old photographs anne's agitation seemed to be increasing and determined to keep stone from addressing her for a few moments longer i opened the chest to prove my words stone glanced carelessly at the old pictures faded except round the edges and then suddenly rising he picked up two or three and looked at them intently a sudden light flashed into his eyes and turning to anne he said in tones of genuine admiration wonderful mrs van wick positively splendid i congratulate you i looked at him in amazement there was no portrait of anne among the old photographs he held and what he meant i could not imagine but anne knew sinking back in her chair she covered her face with her hands and gave a low moan twenty the mystery solved just then barbara and morland came into the room what's the matter anne morland asked who's bothering you i won't have it he went to her and put his arm round her and seemingly encouraged by his strength and sympathy anne looked up and with an effort regained her poise they're mine she exclaimed addressing herself to stone while her dark eyes flashed defiance at him i don't doubt it he replied and then he looked at her in a perplexed way for a moment these two exchanged glances and it seemed as if they had superhuman powers of reading each other's thoughts then stone gave a little nod straightened himself up and said we must go on whatever the outcome then speaking to us all generally he said i have found the missing pearls i can lay my hand upon them at any moment before i do so does the one who took them from the study wish to say so archer looked at anne but i looked at morland i had a feeling that morland had taken those pearls but if so he showed no evidence of guilt at this moment fleming stone looked at no one in particular and after a moment's pause he said then i will simply hand them to their owner he went to the bookshelves and without hesitation took down a thick volume it was an old-fashioned photograph album fastened with two ornate gilt clasps slowly snapping these open he opened the book 
the photographs from several of the leaves had been removed and in the cavity thus made wrapped in blue cotton was the van wick pearl necklace amid the exclamations of surprise i was silent for i realized instantly that those photographs in the gilt chest were the ones taken from the album to make room for the pearls and that i i had deliberately shown those photographs to stone and thereby offered his quick intellect a clue to the hiding-place they are mine cried anne it was no theft and i had a perfect right to take them when i chose and hide them where i chose but because i took them from the safe in the study you need not think that i killed my husband i took them the day before anne exclaimed archer in a warning voice tell the truth dear it will be better but you did go into the study late that night mrs van wick said stone quietly how do you know flashed anne for one thing your maid saw you coming from the study shortly after midnight but also i found in there on the fur rug in front of the safe two small scraps of the shredded tissue paper from the box which you unpacked i found also two bits in the rosettes of the negligee gown that you wore and i am sure that the bits on the rug fell from your gown as you took the pearls from the safe i do not deny your right to take them nor your right to hide them in the exceedingly clever place you selected but i must ask you to admit if this is true it is true said anne as if at the end of her endurance and then she fainted we went away from the room leaving her with barbara and the maid and as none of us felt inclined to talk we drifted apart fleming stone seemed more than ever thoughtful and preoccupied i would have talked with him but he asked to be left to himself and went directly to the study soon after this luncheon was announced and we gathered round the table in a desperate effort to throw off the gloomy fear that overhung us at first the conversation was on general subjects stone leading the way with his kindly and courteous remarks but all at once anne lifted her great eyes and looking straight at stone said i know you think i killed my husband mr stone but i did not and why should i do so to get those pearls since they were my own anyway i thought perhaps fleming stone would answer this question directly but instead he said were you not anxious to prevent his gift to the library then morland spoke in a terse hard voice you mean by that mr stone that anne took the deed of gift from my father's desk that is not true for i took it myself you did said stone looking at him sharply yes i did i told the truth when i said i left the study before lassiter did but i don't think lassiter knew this and he thought i was there when he went away but a little later i returned my father was not there the outside door was open and i think he had stepped out on the terrace however i took the deed and i have it in my possession still but as it is unsigned it is of no value to anybody but i did not kill my father and i'm telling about the deed to exonerate anne from any suspicion of having taken it anne cast a grateful look at morland and then continued to look at him but with a changed expression i could follow her thoughts or at least i thought i could and i thought she was wondering if after all morland had killed his father perhaps they had quarrelled over the deed and morland was misrepresenting the scene at any rate the net of suspicion was drawing close round the two morland and anne my heart sickened as i realized that it must have been one or the other of these and that fleming stone's unerring skill would yet discover which it is unnecessary to assert innocence until guilt is suspected said stone in a calm voice and until we learn how a murderer could get in and out of that locked room we can accuse no one nor can we assert that it was not a case of suicide and then he determinedly changed the subject nor would he allow it to be brought up again during the meal but as we left the table stone spoke low to me lead the whole crowd out on the terrace he said and keep them there for an hour or so on no account let them come into the house or at least not into the study i must be uninterrupted for an hour at least and then the mystery will be solved he had not set me a difficult task for some reason the members of the little group seemed quite willing to stay out of doors we strolled down to a large arbour on the lawn and sat there talking sometimes all together and sometimes in twos and threes 
after a while markham joined us and inquired how far mr stone had progressed in his investigations anne told him frankly enough that she herself had taken the pearls from the safe and morland repeated his admission of having taken the deed mr markham was excited over these revelations but the strange apathy that had settled down on our people was not greatly stirred by his comments presently archer and beth fordyce went off for a walk around the garden mrs telton asked me to go too but i declined as i had my work of keeping the people out of the house it was just about an hour before stone rejoined us he greeted mr markham pleasantly enough and then turned to me as my employer he said shall i make my final report to you to all of us i replied i asked you to come here but mrs van wick and david van wick's children are quite as much entitled to hear your report as i am let us all go to the study then said stone where is mr archer he went down through the lower gardens with miss fordyce i replied mr markham said stone suppose you go after them he added a few words to markham which i did not hear and then we all went to the study i can tell you all in a few words said mr stone we know that mrs van wick took the pearls from the safe and that mr morland van wick took the paper from his father's desk but neither of these had any hand in mr van wick's death mr van wick was murdered later that same night he was stabbed with this bill file and stone produced the file in evidence after killing mr van wick the murderer himself carefully fastened all the doors and windows and left the room by a secret exit this is the explanation of the sealed room and i will now show you where the secret passage is i did not know myself until during the last hour i came in here positive that there was some such way of egress and after a careful search i found it as you see the study is joined to the main house only by one corner which laps the corner of the house for a space of about ten feet this ten feet on the ground floor gives space for the connecting doorway which is usually used the study is the height of two full stories of the house but the study has only one story and therefore an unusually high ceiling the deep cornice has an immense cartouche ornamenting each corner it seemed to me that behind this cartouche in the corner that touches the house was the only possibility of a secret exit from this room all eyes turned at once to the great shield-shaped affair of which he spoke it was quite large enough to conceal a secret door but at a height of twenty-five feet or more from the floor it was entirely inaccessible it seems inaccessible said stone following our thoughts and there is no ladder or possibility of one anywhere about but i was so sure that my theory was the true one that i examined the floor in that corner and found several tiny flakes of plaster that had fallen then i was certain that the secret exit had been used recently i went in the house and upstairs to the room in which the secret passage if there was one must necessarily open i found in the back part of a deep cupboard a panel and by dint of search i found a spring which caused the panel to open i then discovered that i was directly back of the great cartouche in a word the passage is an exit from this room i will now show you the means of using it we watched with breathless attention while fleming stone mounted the spiral staircase and walked the length of the little gallery at the end he stood with his hand on the end rail quite four feet from the cartouche note the beautiful simplicity of it he said merely loosening a bolt on the under side of the end railing caused the whole end of the balcony to fall outward as it did so the great end bracket beneath swung the other way acting as a counterweight and what had been the end railing of the gallery was now a horizontal bridge straight across to the cartouche moreover mechanism in the wall had at the same time raised the outer shell of the cartouche which was hinged at the top and disclosed a small doorway that is all said mr stone speaking to us from the gallery as i said it is beautifully simple once unbolted a person's weight serves to throw down the railing as a bridge and open the cartouche now you will see that as i step off and through this doorway the removal of my weight causes the railing to swing back to place and the cartouche to close 
stepping off the railing upon a ledge and through the door stone disappeared and the mechanism worked exactly as he had said a moment later he reappeared you see he resumed that is the way david van wick's murderer left this room after securely locking it with the intent to involve the affair in deepest mystery you all know i suppose who occupies the room into which the secret passage opens on the second floor of the house i know said anne it is condren archer and mr archer has gone away said fleming stone significantly i have sent mr markham after him but as i understand it i was employed here to solve a mystery and not to arrest a criminal in fact i have not proved that mr archer is the criminal but i think no one doubts it it was at this point that beth fordyce returned to us oh anne she said mr archer said that he had to go away very suddenly he had had a telegram or something and he asked me to tell you good-bye for him and to give you this letter it is his confession said anne in a low voice as she took the letter from beth i felt sure of it all the time raymond will you read it aloud i was touched at the confidence she showed in me and taking the letter i opened it it bore no address and began abruptly thus this is not a confession but an explanation of why i killed david van wick i know now that fleming stone's penetration will discover the secret passage which mr van wick himself explained to me a few days before his death and so i am going away not fleeing from justice but because i do not look upon myself as a criminal i killed mr van wick not in self-defence but in defence of one far dearer to me than myself last friday night after having gone to my room at eleven o'clock i came downstairs again about midnight with no intent other than a stroll on the terrace i had been there but a few moments when mr van wick joined me i do not wish to repeat his conversation but i realized what a vicious cruel and even diabolical husband he was to the woman i adored i speak frankly of this adoration for it is no secret david van wick talked of his wife in a way that made my blood boil and i was about to tell him so when his attention attracted by a sound in the study he beckoned to me and we looked in at the window mrs van wick was taking the pearls from the safe as we watched she carried them from the room closing the door behind her david van wick drew me into the study with him and exclaimed in fiendish glee now i have her where i want her i shall denounce her as a thief and see if she will then be so high and mighty toward me i begged him not to do this whereupon he accused me of being in love with his wife and made other wicked assertions that i could not stand he repeated his intention to give away all his money to get back the pearls and to denounce anne as a thief and he became i really think momentarily insane in his rage possibly i too lost my mind but i snatched up the bill file tore off the papers and stabbed him in a moment of white-hot anger i carefully locked up the study hoping the deed might thus be an insoluble mystery i left the room by the secret exit which leads directly to the cupboard in the bathroom adjoining my bedroom it was through this panel i had disappeared the night sturgis looked for me i went back to the study to see if i had left behind me any incriminating evidence i found none but after mr stone deduced mrs van wick's presence in the study by scraps of tissue paper i have no doubt he will in some way trace mine as to my act i will not call it a crime i do not regret it i have saved mrs van wick from the cruelties of a monster and i am glad of it but i refuse to pay the penalty for this and so i shall disappear for ever from the country i could not do this if i thought i could ever win my heart's desire but i know anne that in the after years you will find joy and peace with a man who is worthy of your regard though it pierces my heart to admit it but even if through crime anne i have saved you from the further despotism and insults of a brute and the knowledge of that is my reward condren archer i finished reading and there was a death-like silence i think not one in the room wished to prosecute archer i think each heart was praying that markham might not find him i told mr markham to detain mr archer if he found him said fleming stone slowly i fear that i regret doing so he won't find him 
said anne as if in proof of her words mr markham came in mr archer has disappeared he said i thought he might go by train and i waited at the station but he didn't do you want him very much no said anne we don't want him at all don't look for him any more mr markham and then as the tears flooded her eyes she turned to me and putting her trembling hand through my arm she let me lead her out into the sunlight there was no more mystery the secret of the cartouche explained all the two carstairs were dismissed from the vanwick service without punishment for anne never knew of the villainous note that had been written to bring trouble to her we never saw archer again and between anne and myself his name has never been spoken buttonwood terrace was sold and the family separated morland went to the city to live and barbara went for a trip abroad with mrs selton but they may wander where they will it matters not to me for after a time anne is going to crown my life with happiness and i well know i shall never want anybody but anne End of chapters 19 and 20 End of Anybody But Anne by Carolyn Wells Recorded by Celine Major